Thank you, thank you. And I understand some was asking, do you have any books on prophecy? I just happen to have five of them. Ah, Come Lord Jesus, 18 messages on the second coming of Christ from the rapture to the great white throne. Son of Satan, that's on the Antichrist. Come Lord Jesus. We already had that. There's two, two volumes there. Daniel Revelation made plain. Very, very simple. It's the only way I can preach, the only way I can understand it, the only way I can write. Then, how to study prophecy. The progressive program of prophecy. These are around a dollar and a half each down there at the bookstore, and you may order them if you so wish. Shall we go, therefore, to the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis? The ninth chapter of the book of Genesis. Now, did you know that after Genesis 1, 1, everything's prophecy? There you are. Everything's prophecy from then on. And as we begin to study the Word of God, we find out that the first 11 chapters have to do with a united race when there was just one race of people. Then God takes from among the Gentiles a man by the name of Abram. Later his name is changed to Abraham. And it begins what we know as the people of Israel. Now, he was not an Israelite. He was not a Jew. He was a Hebrew. He was a father of the Jews, the father of the Israelites. But you can just say this, that the Jewish people started with well, faithful Abraham. He was a Goy. He was a Gentile. Remember that. And then we do know he had Isaac, and Isaac had Jacob. Then Jacob had 12 sons, and that's where we get the 12 tribes of Israel, because Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so we say as far as Israelites are concerned, it began with uh, Israel, Jacob. But then we go back as far as the dynasty is concerned, the great nation with Abraham. Now, we found out that so long a time it went on, and for many, many years it continued. 500 years we find from Abraham, 430 to be exact, to Moses. Then from Moses to the Lord Jesus, about 1,500 years. Now, we have there nearly 2,000 years before Christ. We have, therefore, the, the Jewish people and the Word of God that's centered in Israel. Everything centered in Israel. The only time that it mentions the Gentiles in the Scripture from the 11th chapter on through Malachi is the Jew, the Jew, the Jew, Israel, and the nations are mentioned as they come in contact with Israel. Then we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Unto the resurrection of the Lord Jesus... All of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John belong under the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, because the Holy Spirit had not been given until after the resurrection of Christ. Now, here is a key to no prophecy. We find Ephesians 3, 1 through 10. We emphasize that over and over again. Also found in Romans 16, 25 and 26. Also in Colossians 1, 24 through 26 that the church and the church age is a great mystery, truth revealed for the first time, never revealed in the Old Testament times, no, nor to any Old Testament prophets. It's a mystery. It's a truth. And it's like Dr. Herbert Lockyer used to say, I don't know how you can see it. He says the first coming of the Lord Jesus in his humility and in his rejection and his crucifixion is seen as a great mountain peak in the distance in the Old Testament. Then they see also his second coming in glory and in power. And when he comes, therefore, not as a meek and lowly Nazarene, but King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, this is what God let them see in the Old Testament. The first coming of Christ in his rejection, in his crucifixion and his resurrection. And then they see him coming in his power. But what the Holy Spirit did not allow them to see was the valley in between these two big mountain peaks, which is the church Age. Now, when we find that, we begin to see, yes, the church age begins with Acts. Then it goes on through the uh, first uh, three chapters and then uh, the book of Revelation. Then the fourth and fifth chapters is a rapture. And then God turns his attention back to Israel again in the tribulation period. The church comes in the very last chapters we do know. But to know scripture, therefore, we find that everything in the Old Testament is is Israel-centered, even Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Israel-centered. It therefore takes all the way up until the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Christ. You find that in the Old Testament. But as the church age, it's not there. It's not there. We have the, the epistles that gives us the church age. There's very little prophecy 
in the church age. Very little prophecy. We find the last days of Israel is a little different from the last days of the church. Now, the last days of Israel actually began with the Lord Jesus. God, who at sundry times and in divers manner spake in time past unto the, unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. When the Lord Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again from the dead, we find that the 69th week of Daniel was completed, 483 years, from the time that it said that the edict should be given to build back Jerusalem. We find that Nehemiah, the second chapter, when Artaxerxes gave that order. And from then on, Israel began to come back into the land and so forth. And it began just a few months after God had given this to Daniel. The 70th week of Daniel, 70 weeks or 490 years, because the word week is a word seven. And we know that the word seven means seven years because this is the same word that we have of uh, Jacob working seven years for what he thought he was going to get Rachel. Then he had to work another seven years to get uh, Rachel. He got Leah, you see. Well, now, here we find 490 years and the millennium is going to be here. That's what God says. But then we find out that when Messiah shall be cut off, according to the ninth chapter of uh, the book of Daniel, where Messiah shall be cut off was the end of the 69th week, 483 years, leaving one more week. Now, it cannot be fulfilled in this church age because the church age is not known in the Old Testament. Paul said that this church age, church and the church age were revealed unto him and, and first and then to all the apostles and New Testament prophets. So, therefore, the 70th week of Daniel for Israel is yet to be fulfilled. Now, all the scriptures for Israel, as we find there in uh, the Old Testament from the 11th chapter of Genesis through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Revelation, the 6th chapter to the end, we find that for Israel is going to happen the last 70th week there to Israel. And these are the scriptures. Now, the church age, we find, is going to close with this. Know this and last days. Now, for the church, perilous times should come. We are living in this perilous time. You do not know when you're going to get hijacked on an airplane. Don't know when it's going to be blown up. Uh, many times, you know, I read over there the 11th chapter of Revelation where it says, the two witnesses are tried to be killed for three and a half years. But when they have finished their testimony, uh, the Lord allows the beast, the Antichrist, to kill them. And uh, they are immortal until they get God gets through with them until they finish the testimony. Many times I've been in the airplane before you had to be searched, you know, and I see a man with a attache uh, case, and, oh, brother, I see them get on. I said, I wonder if they got a bomb in there. And when I got up there, 30,000 and 40,000 feet, I said, Lord, I don't think I finished my testimony. And, and but Lord, let me get down. I pray from the moment I get into I get out. I don't know what's going to happen. We don't. These are perilous times. You don't know when you're going to a supermarket. And when, therefore, a man with a gun would begin to shoot everybody in there. You don't know when you get into an airport, like they do in Israel many times. And they have concealed weapons, they begin to shoot everybody around there. Oh, it's been done there. At Rome also. Been in Rome, been frisked three times at one time. Think of it. And uh, yet they get by, and you remember they had a great shooting there. Well, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know when one man's just going to get... Pot shot, get up on a kind of a hill and begin to snipe everybody that comes by. A sniper there. Boy, these are perilous times. I don't know whether somebody out there say, oh, I don't like that guy. <laughs> up, up goes my head. I don't, <laughs> don't know. I tell you, this is perilous times. Amen. Then we find out this, that as far as the church is concerned, men should be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Why did you know I believe that we have more people that seeing on Sunday a football game of the Dolphins than we have in church on Sunday? One game. Thank God. Now here, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Oh, that's that's right here. Having a form of godliness. Oh my, I've got plenty of religion, but denying the power thereof, denying Christ, denying His gospel, denying His blood, denying His resurrection. We're there. And then they would say this. Know this also that there shall come false teachers, and they shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Brethren, there are many false teachers gone to the world, but try the Spirit. See whether there be a God or not. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. The only way that you can tell whether I'm, I'm possessed with a demon and, and Satan or by the Holy Spirit, and remember when one's preaching, he's going to be 
either possessed by the devil or the Lord Jesus, what he says. Let's try it. How are you going to try it? What they say? The demons speak through the ones they possess. The Holy Spirit speaks through the one he possesses. And so try it. What is it? What they say? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And I tell you here this morning that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. He, God Almighty, took not upon himself the nature of angels, but the seed of Abraham. Amen. That's of God. But every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ come in the flesh is not of God, but is that spirit of Antichrist, where you've heard that it should come in the last day, and behold, it's already here. Hmm. The spirit of Antichrist at that time. So we're in the last days. We certainly are for the church. Now, we find that when Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again, God stopped the stopwatch, punched Time out, Israel. There's been a time out for 1,900 years. Now we find that the 70th week is about to begin. Now, very few prophecies for this church age, the last days, it tells us. And I gave them, most of them, to you right then. But all the Old Testament and, and so much of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, has to do with that 70th week of Daniel. And when that 70th week of Daniel, when it begins, we already have gone up. We go up before it begins. We believe that it begins when he, the Antichrist, confirms a covenant with many for one week. That's that 70th week of Daniel. We're already gone up. But as we begin to see the nations, we begin to see conditions, we begin to see everything. And as I was saying this, they tell me yesterday, did you hear it was 140 or something like that over in Turkey yesterday or day before yesterday? Can you imagine getting it that hot? If I did not know my Bible, I think we're in the tribulation right now. Amen. But we're getting just a little taste of what will it be when we get in there? And poor Israel again will have three and a half years of drought. Oh, my goodness. Just like Elijah caused uh, drought for three and a half years, these two witnesses will cause it. They'll have no rain in Jerusalem for three and a half years. Isn't that something? Oh, what a terrible place this world is going to be. Men shall gnaw their tongues with pain. That's in the tribulation. Now, here we just get that, and then we get... Today, what is the scripture in the light of today's happening? Now, when that 69th week of Daniel was over with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we, that ended 483 years. We find Israel's in the land, and the number approximately was 2,400,000. They came, and then we find the temple was standing when Jesus was here. Then we find that Rome was uh, the mistress of the world. Now, when this 70th week of Daniel begins, Israel will be back in the land. She's already there after 1,900 years. She's back. She, she's looking for the Lord? No. They don't know, but they're looking for the Antichrist because he's going to confirm a covenant with them for seven years and then break it in three and a half years. My goodness alive. They're back in the land. How many of them? 2,400,000 Jews. Isn't this something? How about the temple? It's soon to be erected. They have it already in prefabricated condition. Israel, 63, offered $8 million to Jordan for the temple site, and it was refused. 66, they offered $21 million for the temple site. Oh, that's in a matter of record. And the next year, after being refused, Israel captured it. Since 67, for 10 years they have held it, but they have not exploited it. They're allowing the, the Arabs still to worship in the Dome of the Rock and the uh, uh, Mosque of Aqsa, and they're there. But the temple's about ready to be put up. I asked one man who told me this in 63, said, we have it in a prefabricated condition. I said, it took Solomon seven years to build his. How long will it take you to build you? He said, a matter of weeks. Now, as far as the temple site is concerned, it's still intact. The east wall is there, the south wall is there, and the west wall is there, and the north wall is there. The temple proper, the shrine where the, the uh, sacrifice was made, where they killed the animals at the brazen altar, is covered over now with the Dome of the Rock. As far as the holy place and the Holy of Holies, and then outside of that, the labor is nothing but it's been taken away. But the Lord Jesus, when he said this, that not one stone should be upon another, he was using the word for the temple. There are two words for the temple. The word that he was using meant, therefore, the whole temple proper, not just the shrine. The shrine's gone. But the other's been intact for all these 1,900 years. They have put two constraining walls up there to hold up the, uh, 
the dirt where the shrine used to be, where the Dome of the Rock is now, to keep that dirt around 30, 40 feet higher than the rest. And that's where the shrine is going to be put. All this. When the Lord Jesus said, not one stone should be upon another, you go to the waiting wall. That's the western wall of the whole temple area. You see thousands of stones still intact. South wall, same. Eastern wall, northern wall. It's there. The cisterns are already there. What in the world cisterns for? To flush the blood. When we were there in 71, we had 10 uh, preachers in our party, and we saw the, where they had dug uh, a trench around that octagon-shaped uh, building of the Dome of the Rock and laid pipes down there. And ever so often, the pipes would go down into the, the cisterns there. They said this is to prevent fire, for if they should have fire like they did in the uh, Mosque of Oscar, they could therefore put it out so quickly. But the preachers told me, said, uh-oh, they're getting ready with modern sewage system to have their sacrifices again. And they will. And they'll take the Dome of the Rock, how it's going, I don't know whether it's an earthquake, a bomb, whatever it is. But then, therefore, we're going to bring something out here in the light of uh, today, what's going to happen in the tribulation, see what's happening now. And we can say, my, the tribulation's right here. Yeah. But the rapture is closer than that. Praise the Lord's right here. Just talking to a brother on the outside. I said, well, would you like to go up right now? I said, right now. Wouldn't you like to go up? Goodness, yeah. I don't want to. I, maybe I told you some of you there. A little girl here, 15 years ago in our first class of Florida Bible College. And in the second coming of the Lord Jesus and the nearness of it, got a hold of her. She said, no. I thought she's hurting, you know. And I went back out and said, honey, what's the matter? She said, no, no. And she began to cry and cry. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter, honey? She said, I don't want Jesus to come. I said, why? She said, I'm engaged to be married, and I want to get married first. <laughs> we didn't understand that, but you know, three years later, she wished he had come. <laughs> oh, That's awful. That's it. Uh -huh. But you know what? Oh, my. Just a little longer Jesus, you know. No, I want him to come right now. Amen. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful to go up now? What a group. What a, uh, a cloud would go up. Right here from Hollywood, glorious place to go. When I'm on the uh, tour and I'm going preaching all the time, and uh, I begin talk about the second coming of Christ, and it really gets hold of me. I said, "Oh Lord, just think that's Miss Mary. Meet me up with there very soon, quickly. Moment, a twinkle of an eye. That's fast traveling. Amen. All right, now here we are putting down the keys to know these things. Well, the camera, don't you believe that those seven uh, years went on right after? The Lord Jesus died and rose again, and that the seventieth week of Daniel has already been completed. Now, all right, take your pick. It is, and the way the things are, or, or it's not. Now, if the seventieth week continued, and after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, then the world went into the kingdom. The kingdom. We're in the kingdom now. Nothing's going to hurt in his kingdom, said the 11th chapter of uh, Isaiah. No such thing as animals hurting men anymore. No more wars. Men are beating their swords into plowshare and their spears into pruning hooks. The nation is not lifting up sword anymore. Oh, well, you just think we're having battles. You just think your loved one got killed over there at Vietnam. You just think they got killed in Korea in World War II. That, they didn't. Now, that's just of the mind. That's what one woman tried to tell me, how the um, <laughs> uh, Christian science, you know. And she began to talk about World War II. And, oh, she said, when I was in the hospital there, she said, and this nurse said, oh, my. She said, I'm going to have a lot of things to talk to you. And, I, and the Holy Spirit just let me know. You, you're saying this. Why are we having war if God's such a God of love? Yes, I said. I said, you don't believe in war. You don't believe things exist. You're a Christian scientist. You just think they exist and they don't. Well, there's no war. <laughs> I ended her. All right. And, and so, <laughs> but what about this 70th week of Daniel? It's already over. The one of the greatest things is this. <laughs> the devil is chained for a thousand years. If we're in the millennium now, there's no evil. There's no influence of Satan. Devil is chained. <laughs> One man said, if he changed, he chained to me. Uh, another man said, he changed a mighty long chain. Amen. I, I'm telling you. So we know the 70th week had not taken place as yet. Now, here are the things. 
the United Nations is about to take over Israel. And uh, she's the only foreign power that has her soldiers there in Palestine today. So there they are, the United States. Uh, nations. There they are with the Air Corps, with the Tank Corps, with the infantry. We've been there. We've seen we had six big trucks parked outside of our hotel that they, the personnel stayed in our hotel there all every night, some of them, but six one night. Big trucks out there. They're in Jerusalem right now. Something is happening. What about, is the seventh week of Daniel about to begin? Yes. The United Nations will take over. It's going to have a mandate of it, bound to, because we find in the 14th chapter, in the first verse, of Zechariah says, The day of the Lord cometh when the nations of the earth shall gather themselves around Jerusalem under the Antichrist, of course. But then we find also that there's another nation at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel called Magog. And that's what we're putting our attention to in the light of today's happenings. Magog... Gog, G-O-G, is the dictator. Magog is the country. And we know that's no country but Russia. So we find at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, both are existing. The revived Roman Empire is already here. We don't have to say that. and We just state it again and again. We're finding it uh, given to us by our commentators and also by our historians today who say, that the Roman Empire of the time of the Caesars now revived in the United Nations with the United States thrown in. Well, Brother Cameron, do you believe the United States will be in that part of the prophecy? The only way that we can find the United States in there is when it says about the nations of the earth. If we're existing, if we're existing at the rapture, it's a possibility with their big missiles going around all the time. Eight of them have been going over for five years now. Some I'm loaded with 20 Warheads, and they're all directional, and they can pinpoint any city in America. Two years ago, I was down in Atlanta, Georgia, and I got a Sunday supplement out of there, Atlanta Journal. It says, when the bombs fall on Georgia. And they said, as far as we know, they haven't pinpointed Atlanta, but they have pinpointed Warner Robins and said, if a bomb of 10 megatons capacity falls on Warner Robins, it'll cause a crater three-fourths of a mile in diameter and 175 feet deep to be dug out there, killing everybody in a radius of 50 miles. And then begin to talk about those who have lesser burns and so forth. But we know that our, some of our cities are certainly marked for destruction, and that can be before the rapture. That America can be not existing, but I believe she is because of her love for Israel and will continue even into the last days. Now, here we begin. You say ninth chapter, the ninth chapter of this book of uh, Genesis. Now, what are you getting? In the day where attention is upon Magog, upon Magog. Now, we begin to find of the nations that are going to be with Magog. Keep your finger in the ninth chapter now of Genesis, and let's go over here to the 38th chapter of Ezekiel and find out the nations that are going to be with Magog. It announces it. Not going to be... United States, not going to be Europe, and not going to be any of these, Italy, none of those at all. But here in the 38th chapter, begins there with the fifth verse and tells us who are the nations that are going to be with Russia in the 70th week of Daniel. And it says, sixth, Gomer, well, fifth verse, Persia, that's Iran today. Isn't it, isn't it strange, this was written 2,500 years ago? 2,500 years ago. Now, Persia was known. It's called Iran today. But I think that they said that they're going to be a flourishing power 2,500 years from the time this was written. And, they, and they're there. Persia. Well, Persia, the Medo-Persia, was the one that came after Babylon, as we know. And Daniel and Ezekiel lived in that invasion. But they're going to be existing later. Ethiopia... That's a nation in Africa. Libya. And with them, the Shields. Gomar, the eastern part of Germany. Togomoth, this is old Armenia. Asia Minor, Turkey today. They're there. All of them are lined up. That's getting ready for the 70th week of Daniel. Well, now let's go over here and we're going to find out how these nations that are with, with uh, 
Russia come into the word. Look there, the ninth chapter of Genesis, and beginning there with the twentieth verse. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered in his tent. Within his tent. Now, as we begin here, we find this is the first record of man getting drunk. This is the first time we have a fermentation. You will find that God does not reprimand uh, Noah for getting drunk, as he does for the excess to us today. But you will find out that something had happened during the flood and so forth. And now man begins to live not 800 or 900 years, but down to 200. And then down to three score and ten. Something has occurred. But this is it. He got drunk. Okay. And he was uncovered within his tent. Dr. Unger comes out and says, this is a deliberate uncovering or exhibition of himself. Now, when a man goes to bed at night, he can go and sleep in the clothes and overalls that he worked all day if he wants to. That's his privilege. That's his home. That's his bed. He can therefore put on silk pajamas if he wants to, or cotton pajamas, or a nightshirt. That's his privilege. That's his bed. If he wants to, he can sleep raw. Amen. That's his privilege. Amen. <laughs> that's his, that's his uh, privilege. But here he was. He deliberately uncovered himself. Now here it leads to some speculation that he exi- uh, made an exposition of himself. And uh, therefore, here comes Ham. Listen. And Ham, the father of Canaan, underscore Canaan. Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulder and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son, Ham, had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. He did not curse Ham. Ham was the one that did it. But he cursed the son of Ham, Canaan. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. He didn't say he was going to hell. But he said, A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan, shall, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. The first verse, and you get the answer. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, You cannot put a curse upon anyone that's got a blessing on them. Amen. So therefore, he had to place this curse, and he placed it upon his son Canaan. Now let's go over here to the 10th chapter. This is one of the greatest books on the genealogies of the three sons of Ham that can ever be found in the world. Now we want to talk about, and I won't say this, some years ago, many years ago now, a lady there in Knoxville wrote to me and said, Brother Mark, I'm to teach the ladies adult Coke Sunday school, combined Sunday school, and says, I'm to speak on the 10th chapter of this book. I'm to do it in three months. I can't make heads or tail. Would you get me and give you plenty of time, three months, to get this? So after about a month, I went into the um, office there, and I began to draw. And when I came back, I showed it to my wife. I said, what do you think of this diagram? She said, are you sure you're right? I said, I know I'm right. And, uh, and I said, she said, don't be sure, don't get anything that's not right. I said, of course not. But I said, first time I ever saw it. Tell you the truth, it never dawned on to me. I've read it hundreds and hundreds of times, actually hundreds of times. The book of Genesis, I certainly have. But I noticed for the first time that Ham had other si- sons but Canaan. I had the idea that Canaan was his only son. Canaan was the only son of Ham. I had been taught, I went there in the book of Genesis that we had taught to us for four and a half months. Even the professor up there just ran over it, never saw it. And and I want to say this, so many people come to me among the colored brethren and uh, said, is the curse still upon us? They've been taught that the colored man has been cursed. My good. After I give you this, now I won't say I'm not on the NAACP bankroll. I have never gotten a, a letter from them to be sure and preach this. I want you to know that I'm, I'm just plain old Mark Cameron, a Southern preacher, and, and a Baptist at that. I just want you to know, no, I'm on, not on anybody's side. I just give you what the Word of God said. The black man, whether you believe it or not, has never been cursed. 
Canaan has been cursed. But here I find out, oh, this is something. I find out in this reading of this, I haven't seen it. There it went up there that Ham three, had three other sons. Well, let's look at them and see. Look there at the sixth verse. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Foot, and Canaan. Well, he had four sons, but the curse came upon Canaan. Now let's look at the sons of Canaan down here. All right. And look there in the 15th verse. And Canaan begat Sidon. You heard of Tyre and Sidon. Sidon. And his firstborn. And Heth. Heth is the one, the sons of Heth, that Abraham dealt with had to get the uh, cave of Machpelah to bury his dead, his wife Sarah. And Canaanites. He made that uh, uh, barter and bought this field or that cave. All right. But now Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Gergesites, and the Hithites, and the Archites, and the Sinites, and the Arvadites, and the Zemorites, and the Hamathites, and afterward were the families of Canaan spread abroad. Then I go here, will you go with me over here to Deuteronomy, the seventh chapter? And this is spoken of by Moses just right after he, they come out of the wilderness there for 40 years, and he's giving his last instruction before he dies. And before Joshua picks it up. And here we find in the seventh chapter. And it says this. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it. And hath cast out many nations before thee. The Hittites and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Seven nations greater mighty than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee. Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Said, so destroy all these. And who are these? These people are the descendants of Canaan that had the curse upon them. Now, as we go back here, we begin to find out what about these other three sons? We find Cush, and the word Cush means black. We go there to Mizraim, and the word Mizraim means fortress. And the word foot, P-H-U-T, means F-O-O-T, foot. Well, what about these today? Did you know that every time you read in the Word of God and you read the word Ethiopia, go to your lexicon, go to your dictionary, most of you have Strong's Concordance, go back there and you'll find in the Hebrew that the word uh, Ethiopia comes from the word Cush. And did you know every time you read in the Word of God, in the Old Testament of Egypt, you go back there to the Hebrew word, and the word is Mizraim. And the, every time you find in your Bible, that far, the word uh, Libya, trace it, and you'll find out it is foot. Now, it is true that Mizraim, Egypt, Cush, Ethiopia, uh, foot, went to Africa. Africa is called the land of Ham. They never had the curse upon them. Canaan had the curse. Where did Canaan go? Well, he went to Africa. No. Where did he live? In the land of Canaan, Palestine. My goodness, a lot. that's where they were. Now, they had the curse upon them. Mizraim never had him. Foot never had him. And Cush never had it. In other words, Ethiopia never had the curse upon them. Uh, Egypt never had the curse, and neither did uh, uh, Libya. And there they are, Cush, Mizraim, and Foot. But it's Canaan, therefore, that has the curse upon them. And did you know there are no Canaanites living today? Unless you may want to include those 103, it might be lower now, of the Samaritans. Remember in 721 B.C., when the Assyrian people came and took the ten upper tribes into captivity, they left the very poor of Ephraim, Manasseh, and portions of the Levites there to till the land. And when they took the rest of the people by the millions into Assyria, these people, descendants of Ephraim, Manasseh, and uh, Levites, began to marry the Canaanite people. And unto them were born this half-breed group known as the Samaritans, and the Jews wouldn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. Today, there are only 103, maybe less. 
103 less. And they've been intermarriage. Brothers and sisters have been marrying. Cousins have been marrying. Many of them are imbecilic. And yet we find in the 14th chapter of Zechariah, when the temple is erected by Jesus, when he builds his temple and the millennium begins, it says, no more shall the Canaanite come into the house of God. Why? Because they've been liquidated. And we find out that if Egypt comes and, doesn't, and does not send a representative during the millennium, once a year, to the Feast of Tabernacles, no ring comes upon Egypt. It shows us that Mizraim doesn't have the curse upon cause. The descendants of Mizraim, which is Egypt, shall come to the house of God during the uh, millennium. Now, now today, isn't it strange that we begin to go over to the three sons of Ham that are going to be existing in the last days? Who are they? Cush, which is Ethiopia, and Mizraim, which is Egypt, and then Phut, which is Libya. Put it down, right down. We find that one of these three shall be on Israel's side. And we find that in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. We find the other nations that are going to be against Israel. Libya is against Israel. We find that, that uh, Ethiopia is against Israel, but Egypt is not. So on that life for seven years, we began to say, watch Egypt make a treaty with Israel. They've done so. They're trying now to get Iraq and Syria to do so. Uh, Assyria used to be, or I should say, old Assyria is now the two nations divided, but they'll be together, Syria and Iraq. And so that has been trying to get them to come together. What has happened in the last four days? Egypt which is on the side of Israel now, will be, has been fighting Libya, two sons of Ham. Now we find uh, that Egypt has cut off every relationship with, with Russia. But these other two are not. We find that, that Russia has armed Libya all with such a great air force, with such great uh, uh, mechanical things that can knock anything coming out of there, but they haven't been able to do it so far, of Egypt. But we find that she's armed her with a great uh, air force. We know this, that we were kicked out of Libya about seven, eight years ago, our air force, with the many bases there, and we got out. Well, what about Ethiopia? People say, you're wrong about Ethiopia. They got a Christian king there. Well, they got rid of him, Hollis Elias, and then he died. Now, what do we find? Have you been seeing your newspapers? Have you been seeing your TV news of Ethiopia? Here we find that Russia has gone and is using the soldiers of Ethiopia as an arm of the Russian army in Africa. She has, therefore, equipped them and with uniforms and fighting material by the tens, let me say this, hundreds of thousands. And they are there with their observers and everything, using the Ethiopian as their arm and with them. And God says that Ethiopia is going to be with Russia. God says Libya is going to be with Russia. And it says also that Persia, which is Iran today, will be with Russia, and they're right next to him. She's with her. And then we know Gomar, that's the eastern part, because the western part was always with the Roman Empire, and it's that way today. The western part of Germany is with the United Nations. The eastern part is with Russia. Gomar, two years ago, uh, this is Togomar, which is Turkey. Didn't they kick us out of 20 bases? And we find four years ago that she opened up the Dardanelles to let the Russian fleet their great uh, ships come out of the Black Sea through the Dardanelles into the Mediterranean. And now they are in the Mediterranean with her great fleet, Russia is, for the first time since 1918. And they are matching us ship by ship and even outnumbers on certain things. What do you say? The nations now are there. They are combined. That's, now, this, what we see right now, is the beginning of what it will be in a solidified condition 
in just a few short weeks, days, when therefore the 70th week of Daniel begins. Everything is here. My, we can just see it getting formulated, getting organized. There'll be two world religions. There'll be Babylon, the world, mysteries, and all the world will be the one church and Israel. Israel will have her temple. Then when the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel, he destroys the temple and says, I'm God. Then the ten men that he has will rule the world. They will go and eat this prostitute, and they give their power unto the Antichrist. He shall be absolute as far as politics is concerned, as far as religion is concerned. Oh, that's coming very soon. It's all set up. Who would ever thought 2,500 years ago that these nations could ever be revived and therefore being uh, uh, carried out? We couldn't even think of it 200 years ago. It was beyond people who studied prophecy 100 years ago. Today, we're seeing all these things being formulated, and we say the coming of the Lord Jesus. For us, is very near. We haven't got much time to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ and win precious souls. Oh, Brother Cameron, just wish the Lord would delay his coming a long time. I got so many people I want to witness to. And lead them to the Lord Jesus. But did you know the longer he delays, the more souls go to hell? Oh, may he come very soon, very soon. Isn't it wonderful to be living in these days? It's a reality. Oh, my, here it is. All these things are pointing toward the tribulation and toward the coming of Christ back to this earth. But God has not appointed us to wrath, the tribulation, but to attain deliverance by his son, the Lord Jesus. We're going up before. Oh, may. We can see these coming. Continue to pray. Continue to witness. Continue to give. Continue to live for the honor, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like this. Isn't it wonderful to be saved and know it? All to know that you've trusted Jesus Christ. And know that he, the Son of God, came here and took upon himself human flesh and went to the cross and paid for our sins. And after doing so, he died. He rose again from the dead. Now able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by him. I'm so glad I trusted him. I place my faith in him and him alone. No works, no good deeds, not works of the law, but just simple faith, trust, belief in Jesus Christ. And he has accepted me and him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And he has kept me. Oh, so wonderful, therefore, to know now. That I'm saved and that's already assured. I don't have to have any waking moments anymore. But I'm saved. That's signed and sealed and delivered. And I have the Holy Spirit which is a seal. Of God Almighty unto the day of redemption. But now to know God's will. And be in it. Is it one of the greatest joys of serving God. If I know the will of God. And I get in it. The work of God that he wants through me will be accomplished. What is God's will for your life as a born-again Christian? Are you God's person, God's man, God's woman? God's uh, boy, God's girl? You're born again? Do you know God's will for your life? If you do, get it and remain in it. All to have the joy and peace that passes all understanding. I have peace with God when I got saved. But I have the peace of God by being in his directive will. No matter what comes. What disappointments. What kind of health problems may come. What kind of financial problems may arise. Everything is all right. I am in the will of God. Nothing can happen to me but what God so wills it. But are you born again? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Should the trumpet shout for the saints of God, would you be left and not go up because you're not saved? Shall we bow our heads just a minute, close our eyes? We just want to give this. Maybe you have, therefore... Heard more invitations, more invitations, more invitations. Might not be a lost person here, but someone may have just come in. And out of curiosity, just want to hear 
But way down deep, you do not have the Holy Spirit. That's one of the one of the great assurances that we have, that His Spirit beareth with our spirits that we are the children of God. You don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're not saved. He that hath not the Spirit is none of His. But, oh, I want sins to be paid for and forgiven. I want to go to heaven. I want to go up at the rapture. I certainly do. I want to have the blessed Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth, show me things to come. I'm not saved, but I want to be saved. I want to trust Jesus. I believe with all my heart that he died for me and rose again from the dead. And I'm trusting him right now. And I, in my heart, I'm saying, Lord, I'm trusting you. Save me. You're doing that right now. Isn't that marvelous? You are. He'll give you his Holy Spirit. He'll give you the assurance. I want to pray for you. All of those of you who say, I have trusted Christ the best of way I know how. As I'm trusting this chair to hold me, I'm trusting him to hold me and save me. I'm trusting Jesus right now. Brother Karen, pray for me. We won't put you on the spot at all. Won't have you to come down, but just pray for you now. You're here and you're trusting Christ? Yes, I made that commitment. I have, Brother Mark. Will you just raise your hand? Not raise your hand and say, yes, I made that commitment. Anyone here? Oh, I know we've seen this place time and time again. I want to trust Christ as my Savior here, and I'm trusting the best way I know how. Pray for me in a hand. Just raise and say, pray for me. If you don't have the assurance, maybe you're just not saved. Well, if I'm not saved, I'm going to trust him now. All right. Anyone here? Say, I'll trust him now. Father, we just want to thank you for the testimony and music that we just heard. Oh, that wonderful little song we've heard since we were children. That our Father in heaven has given us his Son. Jesus loves even me. Thank you for loving us, Lord, dying for us and saving us, rising from the dead. And you're coming for us soon. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.